Welcome to Firefighting Today, the weekly video roundtable discussion show where we discuss all things fire service related. Firefighting Today is a production of PeteLamb.com. And now your host, Chief Peter Lamb. Welcome and good evening. I appreciate each and every one of you taking some time to uh, be with the roundtable tonight. Uh, it's always appreciated. We have a very, very good show tonight that uh, all our shows are good. What am I talking about? But uh, we got a very good show tonight with a case history. Uh, Chief Cagno is going to recount a, a very, very significant injury that occurred to him very, very young in his career. A um, couple of stories. We'll let that go. Uh, Folks in the chat room, you can you can sign in. Let me know you're there. We may hold the chat room questions to the very end. So uh, if you are in the chat room and you do want to interact with the panel, feel free to leave uh, a YouTube message, and we will drag that right in. We may hold uh, the chat room till the end, but I'd prefer if you've got questions, let's not get jammed up at the end. Let's put them in there. Uh, certainly, and let me know you're there. If you are not on the YouTube page, but you're watching on one of the web pages, uh, if you are using Twitter, uh, feel free to uh, send us something. If you use the um, at Pete Lamb, we're monitoring Twitter, and we'll be able to get those comments in here as well. So we appreciate that, certainly. All right, let me introduce the panel. For those that don't know, my name is Peter Lamb, a fire chief, a firefighter training podcast, and a couple of other things, PeteLamb.com and all of that good stuff. So let me have the panel introduce themselves tonight. Uh, Brad, I'd like to start with you. So introduce yourself to the panel, to the uh, viewers. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brad Dockery. I'm a captain here at Naval Station, Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia. Chief, Chief Cagna, thanks for having me on tonight. Really looking forward to it. All right. No problem. Chief Pernesti, say hello. Good evening, everybody. Joe Pernesti. I'm with the City of Valeria, Ohio Fire Department, just west of Cleveland. I'm an assistant fire chief there. I've been on about 29 years. And once again, I'm honored to be on the panel. Thanks, Chief. Not a problem. Chief Burns, give us a couple of words of welcome. Thanks, Chief. Kevin Burns, retired deputy chief with Framingham Fire Department. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure, Kevin. Um, Chief Fling, say hello. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Rob Fling, Dix Hills, ex-chief, Long Island. Um, proud to be here. Thanks for having me again, Pete. Always good. Good things from Rob. Um, and certainly not to be slighted, Chief Whitley, say hello to the audience. Hi, Warren Whitley, uh, retired assistant chief from Prince, Prince William, Virginia. And shout out to Lane out on the highway. Right. We, we all believe Lane can't be with us tonight, but we, we all have a little side bet that he's watching on YouTube. So we may hear from him for sure. So I, I didn't introduce John. Uh, John, why don't you just uh, do an introduction um, and then just go, uh, go right into the story? Okay. First of all, I want to thank you for having me and uh, allowing me to share the story. Um, this, uh, this event started when I was a young call firefighter, um, I was uh, 18 years old at the time. It occurred in January of 1980. Uh, at the time, the uh, department was experiencing a rapid growth in, uh, in responses. So we were progressing towards an all, all paid department. Um, at the time, we had a very unique call system where we had a four platoon system. And if your weekend shift, if your shift fell on a weekend, you worked a 24-hour shift. So on that particular day, um, we decided that we were going to go down to one of the vacant mills and have a multi-unit drill with uh, the district engine company, uh, the engine company in my house and the truck that I was assigned to. Um, the drill started out uh, with some preliminary planning um, as to what the operation or the evolutions we were going to do for the day. Um, because the mill was slated for uh, either demolition or restoration, um, and we had had a few small incidents there, the evolution that particular day was to practice stretching over the area ladder, um, utilizing a two and a half inch hand line that would be wide off um, 
either on the floor below the fire or off remote from from where the fire would be located um that particular day was a, a very damp um raw cold day uh, it had kind of snowed the morning before uh it changed over to rain and the weather did play a factor i'll talk about that a little later so the day starts off uh with the uh engine company stretching a two and a half inch line up Ladder one's aerial. Ladder one's aerial was raised to a third floor balcony window. Um, you got to understand this mill was rather large. On the front end of the mill, uh, or alpha side was side one on our, our department at the time. The grade was uh, slightly higher because there was a river that ran the face of the mill. Um, like years ago, it probably powered the mill at some point. Um, and then the backside was a, a four or five story drop. But the mill itself was a, a five story um, uh, brick mill. And then it had a three and a half story uh, combination uh, brick and wood frame addition to it that, that was part of an original structure that had been built in the early 1900s, I guess. Um, so our job was to raise some ground ladders, uh, raise ladder one's aerial to the third floor window, uh, and then assist the engine companies with the stretch. Um, initial engine company went up with some bundles. Um, our engine stretched the two and a half inch, uh, up the aerial. In the process, uh, one of the couplings had gone in between uh, the rungs of the aerial ladder. We were using an older Maxim aerial ladder at the time. And I was coming up just behind them. I noticed that when they were pulling the line, it, the butt had snagged up against a couple of the rungs. And, um, you know, back then we didn't have, you know, harnesses or anything like that. So realizing that um, I was going to probably have to take both hands off the rails, I decided that I would kind of do a, a half leg lock, if you will, on the rail section of the aerial ladder. Now, if you can imagine that, I was basically just hooking my foot in between the sections of the aerial. Um, <clears throat> we had a large transmission line that ran the face of the mill. It was parallel at the face of the mill uh, to a probably a four bank transformer substation. So I was aware of the, the high tension lines, but we were clearly a good 10 to 15 feet away from any portion of them lines. So in other words, you can imagine the aerial ladders up on an angle about maybe 45, 50 degrees. The wires were perpendicular crossing over our head. So as I'm coming up the aerial ladder, I noticed that the butt was stuck. I signaled to the crew ahead of me to stop pulling on the line so that I could um, release where it was snagged. So at that point, they pulled back on the line and I rapidly raised my hand again to signal them. And in the process, I heard this huge buzz sound. And the next thing I knew, I was going off the side of the aerial ladder. Now, you got to understand, this probably took about a millisecond, and I was hanging off the side of the aerial ladder. Um, it appeared to go in slow motion, but in reality, I was just falling over. The next thing I noticed was this severe tug on my knee joint because my body was completely off the side of the aerial ladder. Um... So now I'm, I'm hanging upside down, if you can imagine this. And the only thing that's keeping me from falling, and by the way, if I fall, <laughs> all I could think of is, uh, you know, I'm not going to die from, I knew I got electrocuted right away. I had thought I had somehow touched the wire or the wire had maybe broke or something. And somehow something came in contact. That was my initial thought. Um, so I'm hanging off the side of the aerial and, probably 50 feet below me is this 
river that at that time of the year was very high, so it's it's going at a clip. And all I could think of is I'm going to fall, not to my death, but I'm going to fall to the river and drown. Uh, at about the same time, I could hear a lot of commotion, a lot of yelling. Um, next thing I notice, there's a guy above me, and he's he's yelling for me to reach out and grab his hand. And then I'm yelling, no, get back, get back. I, I touched the line. So first thing I'm thinking is that I'm energized and that anybody that touches me is going to get electrocuted. Um, and it felt like my arms were just dangling over my head. But in reality, they had kind of contracted. So they were actually like this at my chest level, but I'm hanging upside down. <clears throat> The officer on engine one came down the aerial um, walking because like, the aerial is at a low, a shallow elevation. He came down. He literally grabbed my coat and righted me up. When he righted me up, I kind of fell into the aerial. And the first thing I noticed was a hole about the size of a soda can in my leg. Um, it was slightly blackened. Uh, we were wearing hip boots back then. So, you know, I could see right through, you know, the burnt hole in my pants and all I could see was this hole. There was no bleeding or anything like that. It just was, you know, it, what I, I, I had identified at the time, but it was one of the exit wounds. At that point, I started coming to my senses a little bit. Um, they were trying to get me up. I was pushing them away. And then I decided that I would walk down the aerial. So I kind of walked down the aerial under my own power. I got down to the turntable. And about that time, I started feeling this enormous pressure in my chest. It felt like my heart was going to just blow right out of my chest. A um, couple of guys had, had come over... Uh, they kind of helped me down from the turntable down to the ground. Um, at about that point, everybody that was at the drill had either come down from the aerial ladder, from inside the building for when it, so not as a crowd around me, I was coming down <clears throat> and then I felt like I was burning up inside. You gotta understand that when you have that much voltage to go through you, we didn't know what it was at the time. I would find out later that I took about eleven to 14,000 volts from a 35K transmission line. So my blood basically almost boiled. Um, the only pain I began to feel at that point was wherever I was perspiring around my neck, uh, my elbow joints, my knee joints, my groin, a um, little bit of my chest where I was sweating. I could feel like a burning sensation. So I started asking the guys to strip my, my turnout gear. Um, in the process, as they started to unclip it, I noticed that they were actually burning their hands because it had gotten so hot. They finally stripped my turnout coat off. Uh, in the process, they pulled my gloves off. And back then we were wearing the old, old fashioned orange red ball gloves, if you remember them. Um, and I noticed that there was a small pinhole just coming out of here on my left finger. And then there was another small blackened area, if you can see over here, coming out of my right hand. So I have a hole in my leg and then sm two small pinholes in each hand. At that point, they, uh, they brought the rescue around uh, and they decided they were going to Put me down onto the stretcher. Um, and then you got to imagine, this thing's all unfolding rather quickly. So everybody's kind of just running around. Um, you know, it's like chaos is ensuing. Um, and they had put me down on the stretcher backwards. And I knew that right away because I could see the foot of the stretcher. And you imagine, back then we had the old stretches with the handle on one end and that little foot pad on the other. So they cut my clothing away to see what my injuries were. And as they're doing it, my head was at the exhaust of the uh, exhaust tailpipe of the rescue. So I had actually had the, the wherewithal to ask them to move the stretcher because the carbon monoxide was in my face. But 
<clears throat> so they get me into the into the rig, and then they realize that uh, the stretch is not gonna um, go. And I kept telling them I'm backwards, I'm backwards. Um, they pulled the stretcher out, rewrited me, threw me back in, uh, and off we go to the hospital. Um, you know, <clears throat> at that point, everything starts to come like now. So I, prior to that. You can kind of hear things, but everything's like in a distance and, and everything seems to be going slow. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom, and then everything's happening very fast. You start becoming more aware, your senses are starting to come back. And I realized that this rescue is going at a crazy clip, and, you know, for obvious reasons. Um so I, you know, I reached up to the, the medic that was in the truck and I said, you know, tell them to slow this rig down. I don't want to get killed on the way to the hospital. So it was a, a rather short trip, actually, from the location of where we were to the hospital. It was probably all of about, uh, I would say maybe five minutes, six minutes. Um, we didn't have communications to the hospital like we had today. Um, we had the old hair system, I, I believe. Um, but somehow they had called the, the hospital and they said they were bringing a firefighter in that was electrocuted. So I, I guess the hospital was under the impression that the person that they were bringing in was coded. So when they wheeled me into the ER, you know, the nurses and the doctors were kind of in the hallway waiting. And that the first person that came up to me said, this kid's still alive. You know, and I pretty basically said, yeah, let's keep it that way. So now we're in the ER and, uh, you know, there's a flurry of activity. Uh, you know, they're patching me up to, to all the equipment and stuff. And then uh, next thing I know, there's a priest over me who begins to give me the last rites. So this is when reality starts to sink in. Now I realize you can hear the monitor going. You know, and it's not beeping at a, a rapid pace like I think it would be. It's just barely going. So I get to think you're going to check out, and then you got a priest over here who's starting to read you the last rites. Um, so, you know, I gave him some choice words and told him to leave. Um, next thing I know, the doctor's over me, and uh, he's trying to explain to me the significance of what, what had happened. Um but like I said, the, you know, other than the, the the tremendous pressure in my chest and the, the, the burns that I had, uh, you know, from the areas that I was perspiring, I didn't feel much pain in my hands at all. And uh, in fact, the, if you looked at my hands at the time, um, it didn't look like there was much damage. The only real significant injury I thought I had was to my leg. Um, fast forward, uh, I wake up the following morning in the, uh, in my hospital room, I'm in a burn unit and the, uh, nurses come in for the first time to do the first debridement. Uh, and this is when I realized the significant, uh, significance of the injury. So back then there were no whirlpools or anything like that. What they used to do was we call wet to dry soak. So they would come in with, you know, a sterile bowl. They would undo the dressings and then they would take flush, dip them in hydrogen peroxide, and then they would debride the area. So they're coming in to do this process and they undo the dressings. And I didn't know I had gone down to the OR that the previous night. And so, they un undo the dressings and I, they raise my left arm up. Now, if you can see right here, you can see the discoloration. Well, when they took that dressing off, you could actually take a pencil and you could put it between a medium and all the bone. So this was the entry point. And like the difference between thermal burns and electrical burns is that they burn from the outside in and they'll burn right into the bone. So you go from first, second, third with thermal, and then with electrical burns, you go fourth, fifth, and sixth. So I had completely burned away 
part of my ulnar bone. I had lost my finger. They had amputated it during the, the breathing process in the OR. I burned away all the tendons in my left hand. Um, part of my ulnar nerve was damaged. My medial nerve was damaged. Tremendous amount of muscle was gone. On my right hand, that was an exit wound. I had burnt away the joint capsule, so when they undid the dressing on this hand, my thumbnail actually just fell. You can just imagine, because there's no joint here, and it would just fall down. They would have to actually hold it during the debriefing process. <clears throat> so, like I said, back, back in 1980s, um, in Rhode Island anyway, burn, burn treatment wasn't that sophisticated. So the process was these, you know, basically every three hours they would come in and do these debridements. Um, and you're gonna imagine they, they'll wrap these things wet and then they wait for them to dry. And then when they remove them, that process is like taking a bandage off. And if you've ever had any kind of wound where the bandage sticks um, to your skin, well, that's what it's like, but it's like amplified by a thousand times. And they would be doing that every three hours. And every three hours when they came in to do that, I kid you not, I would pray to the Lord to take me. A um, couple of days go by um, the flurry of activity, uh, I had a lot of support, all the firefighters were coming in, um, friends from high school, uh, so I had a lot of people during the day to keep my mind off the pain. It was the night hours that were probably the most difficult because they wouldn't medicate me as much at night, um, for fear of, uh, getting addicted to any of the, uh, narcotics they were giving me. Um, cause they knew I was going to be in the hospital for a long stay. Um, just to kind of do this, the long and short of the story, I actually spent, uh, almost five months total in the hospital initially, um, and had, uh, if you look at this shot here, um, this is probably four weeks into it. Um, you can't really tell, but my right, my left arm is actually sewn inside my abdomen. They did what they call an abdominal flap, which is they uh, incise your, your abdomen. They take your arm, they implant it right on top of your abdominal wall, and then they sew <clears throat> that lower half right around so your arm basically grows in your stomach and you have to lay that way for 30 days you have to be prone um, i was in a striker frame for most of that time um, for those who don't know what that's like uh, it's basically like a stretcher on top and a stretcher on the on the bottom it's made out of like canvas and they would rotate you every so many hours so you didn't get bed sores um, so I did that for 30 days and then they removed my left arm and then they put it at my right hand, um, basically off to the side of my abdomen, a little bit proximal to my hip. And then I laid like that for another 30, 30 days. Um, and the purpose for that was to save my arms. Um, I can remember the doctor coming in when he did the abdominal flap initially. And, uh, you know, he told me that I had significant damage. Uh, the chances of saving my arm below the elbow was slim and none, but he was going to give it a shot. So when I went down for surgery that day, came back, woke up uh, <clears throat> the following morning and everybody was coming in, you know, no one was really saying much. They all had this look of doom and gloom. Um, and I was too afraid to ask, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> I think back of it, you know, I, I couldn't see my fingers in the photograph, my fingers are exposed, but initially I was completely wrapped up. So doctor comes in a couple of days later, he had gone on a ski trip 
Slides is going to come in and check on things. And uh, he starts cutting along the side of my waist. Starts pulling out all this gauze that was full of, uh, you know, blackened, goopy stuff that had been oozing out. Uh, it smelled like hell. And then all of a sudden, he, he's digging in there with like a forceps, and he pulled out a finger. So much to my relief, I realized that, uh, you know, at least I had my, my arm was still there, was still intact somewhat. <clears throat> but even, even if they did save my arm, the chances of there being any use was remote because I had damaged the medial and ulnar nerve, which basically controls all the motor function in your hand. Uh, along with that, I had destroyed so many tendons that was going to take, you know, months and months of reconstructive surgery if I was going to gain anything at all. So that's basically the long and short of the hospital stay. Uh, I, I had probably close to 30 operations during the first three or four months. And then I would probably go back in every three or four months after that. <laughs> Um, for reconstructive surgery uh, of one type or another. Um, following that, I was released. Uh, when I was released from the hospital, I had no use of my left hand. I had limited use of my right hand. Um, <clears throat> I was watching the Phil Donahue show one day, and there's this Dr. James May Jr. out of Mass General Hospital. He was a pioneering hand surgeon. He had done the first uh, hand transplant. So I'm watching the show, and I said, gee, you know, I wonder if this guy can do something for me. So, I, you know, I called up Mass General Hospital. Uh, I got in touch with Dr. May's office. It took about a month to get in and to see him. Now, I'll never forget the, the first appointment I had with him. Um, we're sitting down and he talked to me at, at length. Uh, he reviewed my whole case. Uh, and, you know, for a doctor to take a good 30, 40 minutes during an office visit is a long time. But, you know, he said to me, he didn't think that there was much that could be done, but that there was some different things that he was pioneering in and that he would like to try them um, because he thought it had the attitude for, to be a good reconstructive patient. So he decided to do a series of operations that were going to rebuild my hand. That involved removing tendons from my ankles, uh, a serial nerve graft out of both legs, uh, a muscle graft out of my shoulder and elbow. And basically what they did was rebuild and recircuit and rewire my entire left hand. The problem was after it was done, I could open my hand, but I couldn't close it. So I had to re-educate them nerves and them muscles to do the complete opposite, if you will. And that took probably about a good six to eight months of uh, extensive physical and therapy. Um, probably what I should talk about um, for those of you who John, why don't, why don't we take a pause right there for a couple things. There are a couple of loose ends, and then you can you can certainly go on. So uh, just a couple of quick things out of the chat room, and then if the panel has any questions or places that we need to take John on the rest of this conversation. Uh, there was a question. Uh, actually, Joe Starnes was out there. I'm, I'm guessing I know the answer to this, John. What, what type of turnout coat would you have been wearing at that time? I'm guessing just a canvas duck. <laughs> That's a good question because um, the standard issue back at that time was the old cotton duck coats. And if you had been on long enough, you were lucky to get um, a polycarbonate helmet. I had purchased my own turnout equipment, which was a 7.5 Nomex coat, and I was wearing a leather helmet. Um, and I think that that probably played a key role in the severity 
or lessen the severity of burns they did receive. I, I would imagine if I had a cotton duck coat, I would have went up in flames. Yeah, yeah, very good. Um, and and Joe just makes a, a comment, a random comment. Uh, do you believe that there are any significant number of firefighters that they fear burns, electrical or thermal? And you know, I, I think you just told a pretty powerful story for anybody watching, and certainly the panel members as well. Um, I, I think uh, puts a new perspective on that. And I think you just answered, Christine had a question about how long did it take to get function? And I think you, uh, you actually answered some of that. Uh, before John continues, anything from the panel at this point, while we've got, uh, we, we've got a logical stop here, anybody on the panel got anything for John? I, I see, go ahead, Chief Whitley. I was going to ask the same question. All right, John, we were just, you know, in your story, you didn't really tell us how the electricity actually came into contact with you, whether it was the hose flipping up or did the ladder. <clears throat> actually, it, yeah, I left that part out. I never touched the wire. I came in contact with what they call the field of induction. Um, the transmission line was old, so the rubber boot that covers the transmission line was frayed and decayed. So theoretically, you could have been on the ground that day. They had electrical engineers on the scene within hours uh, to uh, perform an investigation, and they found out that you could have basically been on the ground that day and got electrocuted. What they felt happened was that um, I was in proximity to it, and that when I raised my hand, I just got within that, that range. Uh, my gloves... Um, being rubber created, you know, moisture with inside the glove, and they, they feel as though that moisture just drew drew the, the uh, feel induction to me. So I I had never touched the line. Had it had I touched the line directly, I would have probably killed not only myself but two or three other firefighters. Great question, Chief Whitley. Anybody else on the panel got anything for John before he continues? Or the chat room. If the chat room's got something, we're at a good logical stop. Uh, send those questions and we'll collect them for uh, for the end. Anybody else on the panel got anything for Chief Cagno? Yeah, Chief Burns, go ahead. Yeah, Chief, I was just wondering, so, you know, we were all taught stay, you know, 10 to 20 feet away from a wire or it can jump. So are you saying that that may not be the case if, if there was some sort of old transmission line? Um, that's a tough question, Chief, because uh, I, I, the funny thing is the first fire we had, the first fire I responded to after I, I got back on the job was in the same location and the aerial was in the same position. The only difference was the transmission lines weren't there. Um, but over the years, you know, we've been in closer proximity. You know what it is for us trying to get the stick up to a lot of these roofs. Um, you know, the rule of thumb, they, you know, they say 10 to 12 feet. Um, but, you know, I, I, I would be safe to say that they're really, you don't know. There's, there's, you know, there's too many uncertainties there. Um, you know, at all costs, avoid them. Um, but, you know, I was, and I, this is part of the story. I was a young, cocky, ignorant, dumb fireman. Um, you know, I, I had read a lot of books. I was a sponge for, you know, anything that was out there. Um, so I, you know, I thought I knew enough to be safe, um, even at an early age. But, uh, you know, I had read 10 to 12 was a safe distance. So I, I was very, very conscious of the whys being there. And I, and I, I could, you know, visibly see that we were well over 10, 10 feet, if not more um, at the time, but it didn't matter. Okay. Anything else from the panel? Let's do this, John. I got one more in the chat room. So how did it get past the aerial operator that the transmission line was so close when it was extended? I think I think uh, just a little time because uh, the, the live feed is just a little bit off. I think John just answered that, that he was about 10 or, or 15 feet away. So I think that uh, they believed 
it was a safe distance at the time. Uh, Chief per Pernesti, anything from you? Yeah, um, I guess my it was a powerful story, and I, and I do want to hear the rest. Um, after the fact, did any of the chief officers or leadership you know, create a after-action review or a, a pass along to the rest of the department what happened? Um, and uh, what kind of support overall did you get for the of the department after the fact? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I would have to say that the investigation was minimal at best. Um, the report was probably all of one page long. Um, the fire department didn't really conduct a thorough investigation. They did not um, do any after action report to speak of. In fact, I don't even think anybody on the department at the time knew what an after action report was or if it even existed. Um, the only thorough investigation was done by uh, the local power company, um, obviously for, for fair reliability. Um, but um, it, it, as far as uh, support, I got a lot of support from everybody um, during the, the process of uh, recuperating as far as, you know, doing what they had to do to make sure that I, all my needs were met. Um, but as far as uh, a review, uh, lessons learned, uh, what not to do in the future, nothing came out. And that was the norm back then, um, not only for my department, but for, for a lot of departments. So it, it transformed me in a lot of ways, you know, I always say that life can change in an instant. That was my favorite phrase in the firehouse. In fact, if I didn't say it at least once a shift, I said it twice. Um, you got to understand, you know, back then we were growing the pot when we were in transition. Um, there wasn't many form, wasn't much formal education back then. There wasn't even a fire academy. Uh, anything you got, you got on your own from going on your own seeking your own education uh, we didn't have podcasts as great as this back then to, to take a you know to get a lesson from somebody else so you didn't have to do it um there was nothing chief to speak of uh very poorly investigated john i don't think uh on your tablet i don't think you have the internal chat room so warren going back to warren so you actually did not contact electricity there was some sort of arc or flash is that what we'd understand the ladder <laughs> never took a hit there was some arc or flash so this is an air transmission you did say something about the weather did anybody from the power company say that the weather the humidity or any of that may have played a role the the weather was a key factor the, the barometric pressure uh, the moisture content in the air all played a critical role in enlarging the field of induction around that wire um for anybody who knows anything about power um, it's not uncommon to have a field of induction around any large transformer bank. Um, and there was numerous wires going into this transformer vault. Um, but if I had come in direct contact with that wire, I would have fried myself, anybody that was making a potential from the aerial ladder to ground, uh, anybody that touched me, um, you know, would have, would have bought it. I, in fact, that you know, they, they said point blank, I would have continued to burn because the transformers won't even have shorted out. Okay, I think that's that. Uh, Chuck says, you know, too many times issues get swept under the rug in fear of getting in trouble. Investigations are not for punitive actions, but for others to learn from. Remember that the opening line here was this, and, and, and I don't disagree with that, Chuck. I think you're right on. But I think that the key that John says, and, and let us not absolve history, 
But in 1980, we were clearly a different fire service, certainly in Rhode Island, if not nationally. 1980 was a much different time uh, for for what we were talking about and, and procedures. Uh, you know, it, this is interesting that this show follows, you know, our conversation about the safety culture that we talked about a week or so ago. Um, and, and I think that the story is so poignant. Uh, John and I have talked about whether or not that should be shared. Um, so, John, let's go a little further. And, and I, think it's, I think it's time that I have to interject uh, something that John probably won't point out to you. John is a young call firefighter when this happened. Uh, John continued with these debilitating conditions and the use of his hand and did a completely full career up to this rank of battalion chief, served on the Mass Urban Search and Rescue Task Force One, which is a national asset, also served on the Rhode Island uh, Task Force Urban Search and Rescue, and furthermore, goes out every day and swings a hammer. So, John, why don't you talk about, it's not the same as it was, but I think that your spirit, your passion, and your love for this job got you through some pretty significant things. So why don't we, why don't we take this story in that direction? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I had to make a choice early on. I, you know, I could either um, choose to, uh, you know, lay back and let the, uh, the accident rule me or I could rule it. Um, so I decided early on and, you know, we don't have the time and hour to get into the entire story, but um I'll give you just a snippet. Um, I had a, a, a very unique English teacher who came in probably three or four days after my accident. Um, and he uh, was sitting beside my bed. Uh, tears were, were streaming down his face. And he says to me, you know, John, you know what today is? And I said, uh, no. Uh, you know, I was so doped up. I don't think I ever knew what day it was. But he said, today is the first day of the rest of your life. And from that point forward, I made a decision that no matter what I was left with, that I was going to do whatever I could to make the best of it. <clears throat> when I was able to, to use my hands a little bit better, um, I had to fight, actually, to get back on the job because the chief at the time thought I would be a liability. Uh, and in some cases, in some departments, I probably would have been... Um, discharged and given a disability. But, you know, I, I fought to come back. Uh, you know, I proved that I could do everything that anybody else could do. Certainly, I had to find ways around certain things. Um, but the first thing I did was, uh, when I was challenged at this, um, was I, I had a meeting with the chief, and he told me that, you know, in no uncertain terms, it was a bad idea. And, uh, you know, um, there was other positions I could take within the department, but I, I didn't want to hear it. So I, I walked from his office down to the uh, firehouse, went down to the apparatus floor. I had them pull the rig out. I said, put the aerial up, 80 degrees, 100 feet. And I, uh, I took an old, we didn't have harnesses. We had the old Pompeo belts back then. And I, I did a three wrap um, on that Pompeo belt and I, I came down the rope from the top end of that area. And then from then on, there was no dispute on what I could or couldn't do. Excellent. Excellent. A um, couple of things, um, you know, we'll talk about it at the very end, John, at the very end, uh, Christine uh, made a comment in the chat room about uh, admiring your passion and doing what you loved. And she makes reference to something that we'll talk about at the very end when you uh, when you give your closing remarks, John. She's mentioning something. Um, I think I'm vaguely familiar with it, called the boy in the box. So we'll uh, we'll talk about that at uh, at the closing, if you don't mind. So I'd like to hear from the panel. Why don't we start going uh, through the panel discussion? We'll hold it there for a second, John. In the chat room, if there's anybody in the chat room that's got uh, further comments. Brad, what do you what, what is your takeaway as a panel member hearing this story for the first time? Um, what is your takeaway as a panel member and what do you want to leave to our viewers? 
First, uh, Chief, thank you for, for sharing your story, a very powerful story. Um, for me, as a company officer, you, you know, you went out to do a, a training event that day. Um, not really a, an IDLH kind of atmosphere. You're going to go do a simple event and take it back to the house. So something that I take away is a little more planning in my, my training events. So maybe look for a little more hazards than what I probably did up till today. So another thing too that I take away is if you uh, follow up with Lieutenant Moore from uh, We Were Soldiers, he had seven principles that he used to prepare himself for combat. And one was reading military history. And he would use that to prepare himself. Something I think we could do is put up that bravado a little bit and, and share our stories. Thank you. I think that's uh, that's a good point. Also, Brad, why don't you do that now while I got you there? Is uh, how do folks find you on social media if they're looking for you? You can find me on Facebook, uh, Brad Doherty, or you can uh, reach me in my email, OFA Instructor Two Five One at Gmail dot com. Thank you, Brad. Chief Pernesti, um, your thoughts about the story? Any other questions or comments? And what do we leave our viewers with? Certainly a powerful story, and um, a couple things that maybe aren't that don't give up uh, when you're faced with struggles. You can, you know, I take it the chief was very young or a younger person at the time when this happened, and uh, he showed a lot of courage, probably way more than the average person his age at time it's a great story thank you I want to thank you for sharing that inspiration it, it 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 really was it is a moving story and lessons you know things can happen to any one of us and like i said it doesn't matter if fire service or not it's how you come back and uh you did a hell of a job Chief, how do we find you on social media? What's the best place to find Chief Pernesti? I'm on Twitter at, uh, at EFDChief3. A couple different uh, Facebook sites, uh, Fire Training Toolbox. Um, well, you just changed names, but uh, I think it's called the Fire Service Leaders uh, Facebook. I have to Northeast uh, Ohio. Uh, um, leaders or something like that. But uh, anyway, get a hold of me. Okay, great. Chief Burns, questions, comments for uh, Chief Cagno and uh, any lessons or takeaways for the uh, audience? Uh, thanks uh, very much, Chief. Uh, prior to tonight, I had a lot of respect for you and uh, I have a ton more now because I didn't know that story. Um, I almost feel like anything I say is uh, useless after listening to that story. Uh, I would say just, um, you know, personally, I'm going to take it to heart. Uh, not to be so quick to complain. When I got little stuff going on in my life, you know, there are people out there struggling with uh, problems a lot worse than I have. Um, in fact, I think there's one of those old, like Aesop or one of those old expressions, uh, you know, be kind because everyone is struggling mightily with something. Um, so I think I'll try to uh, appreciate the blessings that I've received and uh, to, to the, the people around me who uh, may be struggling. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks for sharing that, Chief, and thanks, uh, Chief Lamb, for putting it on. Maybe the most powerful one we've done in two or three years we've been at this. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Where do they find you? Uh, you're, you've got a Facebook presence, and uh, you want to throw out your email in case somebody wants to reach out to you? Sure. Uh, just my name. If we Googled it, uh, looked it up on Facebook, Kevin Burns. I'm on uh, Facebook and Twitter, and it's burns227 at comcast.net. All right. Perfect. Chief Ling, comments for your questions for John or comments uh, for the audience? After listening to that, honestly, Chief, I have no words. Um, Chief Cagno, to have something like that happen to you and to come back and serve a full career to battalion chief, you're an amazing person, sir. That's all I have to say. 
Thank you. Where do we find you, Chief Fling? Uh, how do we get you on social media? Uh, Robert D. Fling, gmail.com, or face peace on, on Twitter. All right, perfect. Chief Whitley, you were a uh, you were a command staff officer for a long time, lodge agency, um, uh, been around for a long time as a firefighter. Any any questions, comments for uh, for John in uh, in the audience? Well, <clears throat> one comment I'd like to make, John, is good on you for powering through that. Um, I think you've proven attitude is everything. Um, and apparently, you know, I think you were lucky enough to have that group of friends and family that supported you. Um, so I appreciate you sharing it. And like you said, you never know when something bad might happen to you. It could happen to any of we could walk out our front door into the street and get run over by a car. Who knows? So I guess the, the lesson there is live life the best you can every day. Thank you, Warren. Very uh very powerful words. John, you, you've said a lot of stuff, and, and I have the advantage of having you as a friend, um, so I, I certainly have a luxury that some others may not have. But you said something tonight. You said a ton of stuff tonight, and just, you know, in, in true Pete Lamb style, you said one phrase that I want to leave with the listeners. I think you said something, and you can correct me because I'm going to give you the last word tonight, and that is, I thought I was smart enough to be safe. And, and if there is a sentence or a phrase that you better take to the firehouse tomorrow morning, I thought I was smart enough to be safe. And I'm not saying that sarcastically or any other way. I think you said it sincerely. And I think that's how most firefighters go to work in the morning. I think I'm smart enough to be safe. It's an interesting thing. We're not always in charge of everything that happens on an incident scene. And again, I think the other the other point here, and Brad made that point. You know, this was not even a hostile. This is a this was a training incident. This was a training incident. So uh, so very significant. So John, I'd ask you to uh, make a summary statement. What is your message to the people that just heard this story? And why don't you speak just briefly a little bit about the boy in the box? Okay, I, I guess the thing I'd like everybody to, to, to leave with, um, you know, and, and it goes back to what I said earlier, you know, I, I was doing everything in my power back then with the limited resources to educate myself, to listen to senior people, taking wisdom from everybody, uh, eating it all up um, so that I could be a better firefighter. And I legitimately thought that I you know, was prepared to go out there and face anything. Certainly during a drill, we don't think that we're going to get hurt, um, especially to this magnitude. Um, you know, obviously, this is just a, a small version of the entire story. For those people who want to hear the whole story and, and the aftermath, uh, you can get my book, uh, Boy in the Box. It's on Amazon. Um, you can either get it in an ebook or... Uh, you know, you can get a, uh, a hard copy. Um, and, and it pretty much chronicles my, my, my whole life. Um, it's not really about firefighting at all. Um, that's just a small part of it. Uh, it's basically a, a book about life, uh, empowerment, um, how to overcome adversity, uh, and to never give up. Um, and, and I guess the last words I'd leave is that you know, for those that are listening tonight, there's seven, well, six, seven people here that are sharing their wisdom. Uh, and, you know, uh, what the chief puts out every week, uh, and he puts a lot of behind the scenes work to get this out every week, and nobody really sees that. But this is an invaluable resource for young firefighters. For those of us that think that we know everything, you know, it's what we don't know that we learn on, on visiting sites like this and, and spending an hour of your time. And that hour, you know, can change your life, uh, you know. So, you know, like I said, my life changed in an instant. Uh, it could have went a, a million different ways. You know, I was fortunate. And for those that, and I appreciate all the great comments, but it, it was no courage involved in here. This, this was simply an act of, I, I didn't have an alternative. I, you know, I, I had to do what I had to do. 
John, where do we find you on social media? Uh, you can get me on Twitter, on uh, Facebook, or uh, you can reach me at uh, johncagnolita.com. John, I can't thank you enough for uh, sharing your story with the audience. I would ask members of the audience, uh, the panel certainly, and um, uh, any of the folks that watch this, uh, this will be archived, right? So you can uh, share the link and this story will be up there. Um, and, uh, you know, I think if, uh, if the arrangements were right and uh, somebody had a half a day seminar, I think they should call John and uh, go out there and tell that story because there's a lot more to that story that needs to be told. So thank everyone. Uh, thank the panel members. I could not do this without you. I certainly appreciate all of you. The people that listened and watched us live, I appreciate it. Uh, we will be here next week. We are taking, just a reminder, we are taking the weekend after Thanksgiving off. So we will not be here the Sunday after Thanksgiving, but we will be here next week at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, be safe and we'll talk to you then.